Coming up. I was cocked and loaded. Ice Cube's explosive admission on the mid-90s West Coast, East Coast tension that resulted in the loss of two icons. And Biggie wasn't killed by Tupac. And then the conversation between Snoop and I gets heated over who ordered a hit on the dog pound. I got shot at at the video. Biggie called the shot. Allegedly. <sighs> he did. Ice Cube was one of the most important artists in hip hop history. A sharp lyricist with a very furious flow, Cube's voice always demanded attention as he laid the foundation for the pioneering gangster rap of hip hop's most dangerous group, NWA. And during his highly successful solo career, Ice Cube was no stranger to engaging in a war of words with his lyrical foes. He had a considerable battle with another iconic artist, just as the East Coast, West Coast showdown was beginning in the mid-90s. I'm going to find out from Cube just how serious the dispute got. Hey, hey, what's up? You're one of my favorite people in hip-hop. Have I ever said that to you? Yeah, you told me that told once that. or twice. I appreciate it. But you have this demeanor that could be a little scary for some people. And you've had a couple of public beefs. Yeah, it's been an issue throughout my career. Has it really? Can you give me a story about one of those? Well, I, let's let's go with uh, my man Common. Common was an easy target because that was his only his second album. He was well known on the underground, but had not blown up. You know, Ice Cube was a huge artist. It was sensitive, right, at that time. I think the West Coast especially. Yeah, a real ill time. I feel like people know bits and pieces of this story, but no one's ever really heard the whole thing, right? True. Never came out. Mm -hmm. It was something that was said on a record that some say we misinterpreted. But I say we, you still we got stand. it perfectly right. You still stand on that. He had an issue about our style of music. Mm -hmm. And so we put out the West Side Connection. Mm -hmm. It was done as a record to stand up for the West Coast because yeah. I felt like we was taking a lot of shots. They started trading barbs and, and the music was powerful. Folks started to take sides. It spiraled into this whole East Coast, West Coast conflict. You got the mecca of hip hop, mm -hmm. New York, accepting you at first and then there's a turn. We had to... You thought we was doing that? Well, everybody got a little little bit of dirt on their hands. Yeah. So what specifically happened between you two? You know, I said something. He said something. I was going to say something back. But then Minister Louis Farrakhan, he had a summit. Yeah, of course. Remember this yeah. moment. So after the murder of Tupac and Biggie, Farrakhan had his hip hop peace summit. And so all these rappers show up and some people were worried that you and Common were about to be the next victims of a beef that got out of control. Yeah. You know, I actually talked to Snoop and he told me that it almost blew up right there. So we all sit at the table and Minister Farrakhan like, if anybody want to speak, you know, the floor is open. Nigga like Fat Joe stand up. He was like kind of antsy. Like he wasn't on no peak. He was like antsy, right? Mm-hmm. Look, Ice Cube right in the eyes. We held you down. New York loved you. We was there for you when it wasn't there for you. How could you do us like that? We loved you. How could you do New York like that? My whole thing is just stay down. You know, stay down for what I believed in. Mm. Took us a decade to really get it heard on the West Coast, mm. you know what I mean? With Ice T and Easy E and NWA and you know, we was not gonna relinquish any of that ground we had gained. Mm -hmm. You're not pushing us back in the bottle. So Fat Joe took Cube's lyrics as antagonistic to the East Coast? He thought Cube was dissing. Cube wasn't dissing, he was representing. Mm -hmm. It's a difference between dissing and represent. Mm -hmm. He was just representing the West Side because the East Side had already been represented to the fullest. Mm -hmm. And how heated was it getting? 
It was... Uh, wow. You know, everybody was caught in the moment. Mm -hmm. We were getting into our feelings. I was kind of cocked and loaded, but, but then the minister was speaking to us. God brought the idea through me. He told us the story about the nation and Malcolm X. When the nation and Malcolm X was apart, it just gave room for somebody to swoop in and take Malcolm. And it all fell in the lap of the nation because they was beefing in public. So it gives the opportunity for somebody on the side. Mm. Tupac wasn't killed by Biggie, and Biggie wasn't killed by Tupac. These are all side people stepping in. And history starts to rehash it. Biggie killed Tupac. The East Coast, West Coast beef calls Tupac and Biggie to yeah. be killed. I think it was a great gesture on Farrakhan's part. I think it was good for hip hop. You know, surely, you know, let's get together and let's talk it out. I don't know if it actually solved anything. Did Farrakhan's story that day teach you a lesson? Yeah. We decided as men that we should squash this beef. The best thing to do was for me to acknowledge that I kind of pulled this beef out of nowhere and took it too far and that I shouldn't mm -hmm. just let it go. Mm -hmm. And I felt good about that because it don't it don't feel good to be beefing in the street. Mm -hmm. It just don't. You're not comfortable. You know, you're, not, you're just, you know, trying to figure out who everybody is and where they coming from, where they going to strike you. There's no real future in beefing in public. Or that's actually great advice. So Common's record, the bitch and you, ended up being the last word in that feud. You know, it wasn't good to, like, have his record out <laughs> be the last one and <laughs> right. me not being able to, to counter that. Oh, so you had another record to put out? Of course I had another record to put out. I always have another record to put out. And you out. had to hold it back? Yeah, it yeah. just never, never came out. Was it and good? I thought so. I think, <laughs> I think it was pretty vicious. Does anything else stick out in your mind about that day at the summit? Once they came to the understanding, it was beautiful. Wow. At Farrakhan's house, nobody had shoes on. <laughs> and the floors was marble. There wasn't going to be no good fighting going on up in that mall. Everybody's shoes were lined up at the front door. And I, was, I remember the me hearing about the meeting, but you guys didn't really share No, we much. didn't air that out because Minister Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam were like, black folk business. Coming up, Snoop Dogg recounts a time that the rap game nearly ended his life. The homies on what got done. That's not a good sign. Biggie here. Oh, he is? It's gonna be some fighting or some shooting. Gang culture is not safe. And when you play with it, it could end up bad. Snoop Dogg is hip-hop's coolest character, a smooth talker known for his laid-back demeanor. His natural charisma has charmed us all for nearly 30 years. Hey, yeah. How about you? Thank you so much. You know, what are you doing? I'm good, man. But it hasn't always been easy. He's had to keep his composure in some of the most dangerous situations in the history of rap, including a major threat from Notorious B.I.G. that could have cost him his life. And now I get Snoop to open up on how things between him and Biggie almost got very ugly. And how his ability to keep things in control has allowed him to handle threatening situations throughout his life. This is the story of a survivor who's kept the peace long enough to become an American legend. So you got the star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame recently. Yes. You thanked yourself? Yes. I would like to thank me. I had no speech prepared. Really? I want to thank me. I want to thank me for believing in me. I want to thank me for doing all this hard work. I'm a freestyler, so I'm good at that anyway. I just felt like we don't give ourselves enough credit. I did all these hours of this work and all of this that I had to go through, I did this. And I want to thank myself for staying strong and fighting through it all because I could have broke down and gave up and I could have quit and I could have went out yeah. the way a lot of other people went. But I chose to stay focused and to stay hungry and to just stick to the script. Yeah, things could have ended up much differently for you, but you've always found a way to keep things cool and you have a reputation for that. Snoop is like the most friendly gangbanger <laughs> you ever meet. 
He knows how to do it. He deals it delicately. You know, he's not out here banging them up. And he's always so positive and about peace and all of that. Well, you have to be. Yeah. Because, you know, he escaped it. Gang culture. It's not safe. And when you play with it, it could end up bad. But I do remember a story once upon a time, me and my homeboys, we went to the movies, mm -hmm. right? And we was going to the movies in Lakewood. And Lakewood was like a city that everybody could go to. It wasn't nobody's hood. So you sort of kind of safe and you could slide mm -hmm. up in there to go watch a movie. And it was a white neighborhood. So you basically cool. Right. <laughs> I played football on the west side. So a lot of the guys from the west side is my homeboys, but I'm from the east side. So the gang I'm from is east side, and we don't really get along with the west side. So we at the movies. We going in. You're how old? 14, 15. OK. When the homies go to the bathroom, I'm at the snack bar. I see some that I played football with from west coast. West coast and the homies that I'm with don't get along. Right. The homies on what got guns. It's gonna be some fighting or some shooting. So naturally, when I see the homies from the West Coast, I say, hey, cub, I'm here with the homies. I think it's best for y'all to leave. At 14. I think it's best for y'all to leave. Why, cuz? Cuz we deep, cuz. And I don't even want to see nothing happen. I love y'all. Y'all my homies, cuz, and they wouldn't understand, so. I think it's best that y'all just leave. Y'all come back and see the movie some other time. Did they leave? They left. Wow. And those rough times followed you into your very early career where you fought off a murder charge. But you came out of that period as a survivor. You know what I think, Angie? I think uh, just doing me. Like, yeah. I've never done nothing but me. I know. And it works. Like, I'm a natural loving person, so I love people. So yeah. I can get out with the best of them. You know what I'm saying? I don't really have too many enemies or too many people that I dislike. Which is interesting because didn't they shoot at you at the Dog Pound video in New York? Biggie called the shot. Alleg allegedly. No, he did. Allegedly. He did. Okay. I heard it with my own two ears. I got a great memory. My is splendid. Allegedly. He did. We went to go see Folkmaster Flex early that day, and he shined on us. We was going up to the radio station to do this. Yo, New York, DPG, we here shooting a video. We need all you New York rappers to come with us, because we love y'all. We shooting a video at Times Square. We shooting at Red Hook. Come get down with us. That's what we was coming to do. But Folkmaster Flex, he wouldn't let us in. Mm. So then you guys head to the video shoot and Biggie calls the station and went on the air. Right. He said, it's a Tupac dog pound video in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Brooklyn, stand up. Brooklyn, stand up. Stand up. what that mean? This gangster that nobody even would peep. See, what he thought was, he thought Tupac was at the video. Mm -hmm. And this is at the height of the beef. You mother... Right. Got it. But he wasn't. Mm -hmm. So somebody gets shot at at the video. Later on, I'm in Atlanta. Maybe three months later, me and Biggie talked about it because I seen him in a hotel room after he had a car accident. Lucy see me in a lot. Biggie here? Oh, he is? What room he in? He up there. I got some dope. Let me holler at him. Go up to the room. What did he say? He couldn't say nothing. He didn't try to... He couldn't try to clean it up or watch. I heard it. I say, hey, cub, I know you called that shot on me. They missed. I forget you. You said that to him? On, on my mama. I felt like nobody got hit, so I let it go. So when you go back to L.A. and you see Pac and you forgave Biggie... How does he react to that? Like. Now he got the right to say that now, right? Yeah. All the right. How the f you ain't tripping and tried to. And they tried to do me. You went soft after that murder case. You hear me? No, I didn't go soft. Got kids. My son was my world when my wife had my baby. I was like, man. And I had no kids. 
You get what I'm saying? When you have to, to reach for, you, you want that. Yeah, you were smart to not let things escalate between you and all the others back then. It is. Yeah. I think I think I try to find a solution. I try to find an answer. Because even when I was a gangbanger, I would try to, like, put it out. So good of you.